Good afternoon. It uh, gives me uh, you'll notice that uh, that uh, when General Habiger is here, we start on time, even early. Um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, General Eugene Habiger, who is the uh, Commander in Chief of the Strategic Command in, uh, at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. Uh, one interesting thing about uh, about the general's career, which is filled with interesting things, is that he actually started as an Army enlisted man for four years before he uh, shifted over to the uh, Air Force, where obviously he has risen to great heights. Um, he's been um, uh, at STRATCOM for several years, and he's in charge of our nuclear forces, strategic nuclear forces. Uh, general Habiger just came back from a trip to Russia, where um, at the request of Secretary Cohen, he um, paid particular attention to questions involving the security of the Russian nuclear force. These uh, discussions followed discussions that he had initiated with uh, General Sergeyev uh, at Offutt when he visited here, I believe, in the spring. And uh, he will talk to you about his uh, discussions with General Sergeyev first in uh, General Sergeyev's capacity as uh, commander of the Strategic Rocket Force and now is his in his capacity as Minister of Defense in Russia. General Habiger. Good. Thank Thanks you. very much, Ken. It's a uh, honor and privilege for me to be here. I've just experienced something that uh, I, I never thought possible because uh, as a Cold War warrior, I spent most of my adult life uh, sitting alert with B-52 bombers and uh, uh, for a period of five days uh, last week, the Russians showed me uh, a great deal about their uh, specifically their, their strategic rocket forces uh, from their command and control uh, to the uh, allowing me the first, as I understand it, non-Russian ever to go into a nuclear weapons storage area and to see how they uh, uh, keep their nuclear weapons uh, secure and, and safe. Uh, let me back up and, and uh, expand a little bit about what Ken said. The, uh, I first met General Sergeyev in October of last year when uh, Dr. Perry, then Secretary of Defense, asked me to accompany him to Moscow for some uh, high-level talks. I met Sergeyev privately for about one hour before the meeting with the principals. We got along well. Uh, I extended an invitation to him uh, to come visit me at uh, Strategic Command at Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska. And in late March, early April of this year, uh, he did come. Uh, I spent uh, six days with him, uh, 10, 12 hours a day, uh, and we, we talked a lot. I showed him uh, a missile base, showed him my headquarters in some depth, and uh, I took him to one of our nuclear weapons storage uh, facilities at F.E. Warren uh, Air Force Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming. The first time that a Russian has ever been in one of our weapon storage areas. And he saw firsthand uh, this, the procedures and the processes we go through to ensure that our nuclear weapons are safe and secure. Uh, he was impressed. Uh, during the ministerials a few weeks ago in Maastricht, uh, Secretary of Defense Cohen and now Minister of Defense Sergeyev uh, met and uh, Secretary Cohen asked if uh, what Sergeyev's view was uh, of the safety and security of their nuclear weapons. And as I recall, uh, this, uh, General Sergeyev said that his nuclear weapons were uh, as safe and secure uh, as those in the United States. Uh, Secretary Cohen said, well, uh, General Habiger is going to be visiting you here within the next few weeks. Uh, could you perhaps show him uh, how you how you go about doing that, and General Sergeyev said yes. Uh, I was already scheduled to to be in Russia to to uh, do some visits, uh, not expecting at that time to actually go into a nuclear weapons storage site. Uh, on uh, Friday, uh, two weeks ago, that's exactly what I did. I went to a nuclear weapons uh, a storage site at a a road mobile SS-24, uh, rail mobile SS-24 uh, missile base at uh, Kostroma, which is a little over 300 uh, kilometers northeast of uh, Moscow. Uh, I was taken in the facility, uh, shown the security, 
uh, I was, uh, uh, went into a uh, nuclear weapon storage bunker and saw uh, an operational nuclear uh, uh, weapon. Uh, actually, there were uh, eight of them on a, a uh, SS-24 uh, missile, uh, upper stage missile. Uh, went in to talk to the security people who were guarding the facility. As a matter of fact, uh, and every one of my questions was answered. And I uh, was, uh, was, was shown uh, a lot of things that uh, I was impressed with. For example, in uh, the United States, we have a two-person policy uh, involving nuclear weapons. In other words, you have to have a minimum of two people in order to get close to a nuclear weapon. In Russia, it's a three-person policy. In the United States, we have something called a personnel reliability program, where we monitor our people medically and, and uh, uh, for, and, uh, for any kind of uh, abnormal behavior that would make them unstable around nuclear weapons. Uh, the Russians do not have a, a program that's uh, exactly like ours, but uh, they have a similar program. Before uh, missile crew members or before security personnel go on, on their alert tours, which are three or four day cycles, they are personally interviewed by a medical doctor and a psychologist. Uh, I actually uh, saw a demonstration of their capability uh, of their security forces. Uh, it was not something that was planned. It was something I asked for off uh, uh, at the spur of the moment, and I was very impressed with these uh, nine young men, the security force that was task of, uh, tasked with guarding this uh, particular facility. Uh, the detachment of nine uh, individuals was uh, commanded by a senior lieutenant, all very professional. They knew what they were doing. Now, the caveat I would give you is that uh, I saw one facility. Uh, was it representative? Uh, I'd like to think so. Uh, they made it very clear that the facility I was in at Kostroma was very representative of the missile bases in Russia. Uh, as a result of what I saw, uh, I uh, had further discussions with General Yakolov, who is the Commander-in-Chief of the Rocket Forces, who replaced General Sergeyev, and we agreed to exchange security specialists from our respective commands. And uh, hopefully within the next uh, few, several weeks, uh, a team of four or five of his security people will come to one of our missile bases and see in depth uh, the procedures and the, the uh, the technical applications we use in our uh, nuclear weapon storage areas. And he has agreed that uh, he would host a similar team for my headquarters uh, to do exactly the same thing. Uh, we also agreed that uh, we would uh, establish a shadow program where we take the equivalent of a wing commander, a squadron commander, a flight commander, and a missile crew member uh, from one of his missile bases to come to the United States and shadow their respective counterparts for a one-week period meetings, fitness center, dining facilities, everything. And then he would reciprocate with a team from, uh, from my command. Uh, I uh, saw, for example, uh, on, the, on the downside, uh, we tend to use uh, uh, high technology devices much more than the Russians do. Uh, for example, we use uh, uh, television sensors, low-light television cameras to uh, monitor certain areas. The Russians uh, uh, have not made that capital Im investment. Uh, manpower is relatively inexpensive for them, and they uh, use more uh, eyeballs, if you will. I specifically ask if they use things like night vision goggles, and I was, I was assured that they do. Uh, during the course of this little exercise, when I asked what would you do if this were to happen, uh, the two-star Russian uh, Strategic Rocket Forces General who was accompanying me uh, uh, directed them to show me exactly what they would do, and they went to the extremes of not only getting the weapons out, but I issuing the ammunition and then pulling out an armored personnel carrier that was in a, uh, a garage right behind the, uh, the facility where the troops were, were bedded down. Uh, an experience that... Uh, uh, I was impressed with. Uh, we have uh, a lot more work to do, uh, a lot more transparency, a lot more details. Uh, but from my observations, uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was impressed and, and have confidence that the Russians, uh, from what I saw at that one base, uh, have a program which is ensuring the safe 
uh, secure processes involved uh, regarding uh, nuclear weapons. I was also exposed to uh, their command centers, from the national level command center down to the command center in a, uh, a road mobile missile and also a rail mobile missile. And, uh, uh, at all levels, and saw the uh, the the, the uh, individuals on duty, uh, talked to them, asked them questions. Every question I asked was uh, was answered in depth. And uh, the thing that struck me about going into their command centers, command and control centers, is that uh, they are very much uh, uh, geared to a fail-safe mo uh, mode. And what I mean by that is that any one of the command centers, from the national level down to the unit level can inhibit a launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, pretty much wraps up uh, in a, a brief overview of my experience, and I open it up for questions. Yes, sir. John, you said that, that, that you were impressed, especially with the, with the one site you inspected. Um, but you haven't said, uh, do you believe or do you think that nuclear weapons there are as safe as they are here, like Sergei had said? Well, the, the, as I said, I saw one site, uh, and I was, I was assured by General Yakolov, who is the Commander-in-Chief of the Rocket Forces, General Krilov, who is the Commander of the 27th Rocket Army, who uh, accompanied me on this leg of the trip, that what I saw was representative. And if what I saw was representative, yes, I, I have confidence in their uh, safety and security of their nuclear weapons stockpile. They are deadly serious about this. This is a, uh, a very valuable resource. It is, it is something that in the wrong hands would be a very uh, a dangerous resource, and they, they go to great lengths. The security personnel, uh, uh, I was told, and just from what I saw, uh, I, would, I would tend to believe that they're elite. Uh, they call themselves a 10 Alpha Force. They're regularly tested by an anti-terrorist group that uh, comes around to these kinds of facilities and attempt penetration. Complaints from any any of these soldiers about not getting paid or no, sir. any of the no, typical sir. things you hear? No, sir. Did yes, sir. Did you have any discussion of uh, submarine launch nuclear weapons? No, sir. And that's that's one of the things we need to we need to uh, as I uh, when I I uh, gave my debrief to the secretary. Uh, we need to now start looking at the, the long-range aviation, the bomber folks and the, and the submarine folks uh, to make sure that the, these kinds of measures are in place at the other, uh, other uh, nuclear weapon uh, uh, legs of their triad. They didn't, they didn't brief you at all? No, sir. The, the Russians are uh, – the, the structure is a little different. As, uh, as a commander-in-chief of strategic command, I, I've got all three legs of our triad. In, in Russia, you have uh, – General Dunyankin is the chief of staff of the, uh, the Air Force, got the bomber leg. Uh, General Yakolov has got a, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, missile leg, and then you've got a Navy admiral in charge of the subs. And uh, that will be the next step, obviously. What is your impression of their uh, submarine operations and from your point of view? Do you look at it or you have an idea, feeling for it? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, their submarine force is, uh, is getting smaller, dramatically smaller, uh, and uh, will continue to get smaller over the next few years. Uh, from what I see, and I, I look at this very carefully, uh, they uh, uh, ensure that their submarines are, are, uh, are uh, full up rounds, if you will, and I don't, that's kind of a wrong pun, but. Uh, uh, fully capable, and the crews are fully trained before they allow them to go to sea. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, the General, uh, did you inquire uh, with the Russians about these tactical nuclear weapons that General Lebed, uh, Dr. Yavlikov have talked about possibly being uh, un out of control or unaccounted for? And did you talk to the Russians about the possibility of doing inspections with them on those types of weapons as well as strategic? Uh, good question. Uh, no, I did not address that issue specifically with them. Uh, I did ask them, however, about the accountability of the weapons. In other words, how did they know they had all of their weapons where they're supposed to? Uh, and I got back a, a, a very, uh, uh, very comforting response. Uh, at, the, at the wing level, there is a section called the Sixth Directorate. 
uh, and it's a shop of three or four officers, and their sole function is to make sure they know where every nuclear weapon in that wing is. At the rocket army level, there's a, a similar kind of organization. At the, at the headquarters strategic rocket forces, there's a sixth directorate. And then, for whatever reason, at the Ministry of Defense, it's called the 12th directorate. And their sole function is this accountability issue. Uh, General uh, Yakovlev was very open to me. As a matter of fact, we spent uh, almost three hours just talking 1v1 with, uh, with a, uh, a Russian interpreter. Uh, General Yakovlev uh, showed me, for example, uh, his uh, computer screen, uh, which is tied to a local area network, and he sees the equivalent of up to top secret information. Now, you know, I, I do not speak Russian, do not read Russian, and, and when he showed me what was on his computer screen, it was in Russian, but he told me what was on there, and as a, as a very senior officer uh, in the Russian military, I, I believed him. He showed me uh, uh, for example, the page that listed the whereabouts of every nuclear weapon in his command. Uh, he also, sh whenever a nuclear weapon in his command is worked on, uh, it is, uh, uh, that data is presented to him uh, in his, uh, his, his uh, computer. It's updated daily at 6 o'clock in the morning. I was able to figure that out on my own, that it was updated at 6 o'clock every morning. Uh, and another thing that I was impressed with is that whenever the Russian uh, rocket forces move a weapon, uh, whether it's 30 yards from a bunker to a facility to do maintenance on, or from a missile field back to the home base, which may be 30 or 40 miles, a, a minimum of a two-star on the, the rocket forces staff approves that. Open to, to reciprocal accountability on at least their strategic nukes. Is that yes, correct? sir. Now, now, that's one of the things that we're going to have to, I think, w start working with. Uh, start three is the tactical nuke side of the house. Yes, how, sir. How do you square that perceived candor with uh, what some folks say is a lack of candor on the Yamantau mountain complex near Moscow, where they haven't really ponied up a good answer for that? Well, uh, that's that's a dilemma. Uh, uh, I have I've posed that question. I did not pose it on this trip. Uh, I posed it earlier to uh, uh, a, uh, a, a uh, I believe it was General Sergeyev, perhaps it was General Solotsov, who was the uh, the number two guy at the time. Uh, his response to me was it was a uh, a national uh, uh, contr crisis control center. It had nothing to do with the military. Uh, I, we continue to look at that facility very carefully, and Do you believe uh, that answer? Uh, based upon what I see, I've seen, uh, I would tend to, to not discount that answer. Yes, sir. General, have you have you had any discussions with your counterpart on nuclear modernization plans? Plans. Uh, As opposed to just the you know the maintaining of the current. Uh, in other words, mo modernization of their, their program. Uh, just in terms of, uh, the, you know, they're building a new uh, follow-on to their mobile missile. It's, uh, it it uh, will be either uh, road mobile or they can put it in silos. It will be uh, start to start uh, to compliant single warhead. Uh, the the uh, initial operational capability of that missile has been slipped uh, uh, significantly over the past uh, two years, uh, and I think it's just a matter of uh, coming up with the funds to, to get that, that system on the streets. Uh, because of some very, very wise investments, uh, uh, I do not see the United States even thinking about having to modernize any of our forces uh, uh, until the year 2020. Could you discuss? Let me get this thing. I just wanted to follow up on his. What's the new IOC on that on that missile? Uh, you know depends on who you talk to. I'd say the middle of next year sometime. And which one specifically is that? The SS-27. And it was supposed to be two years previous. Well, it right. depends on who you talk to. A year ago, and then mid-year this year, the end of this year. Uh, they, they, they just test-fired here, one here not too long ago, successful test. They're proceeding with the construction of a, a silo to put it in. They've done some work on the, the transporter erector uh, launcher, the TEL. Uh, the program is going along well. They just laid the keel for a new Bori class ballistic missile submarine uh, here last fall. And uh, we don't expect to see that operational until the year 2005 or so. 
This yes, sir. Said was follow on to the 25. Yes, sir. No, similar, similar. Yes, sir. Road it, mobile. Road mobile. Uh, the big difference is going to be uh, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, the 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 tail is going to be a little more capable, better turning radius, that sort of thing. And the missile will have some improvements. Yes, sir. Uh, General, just back to the tactical nuclear question for a minute. Does the strategic rocket forces control the tactical weapons? Uh, no, sir. Okay. So the, the security conditions that you saw, is it possible that they're not replicated in the command that oversees tactical weapons? Yes, sir. Weapons? It, is, it is conceivable. But, but from what I saw, uh, if they're as serious about uh, what they were doing at their strategic rocket forces bases, it would seem to me that that same, that same mentality would, would uh, filter over. But I, I cannot guarantee that. Can I, can I just ask you a question about the other half of the equation, too? Uh, their security perhaps is as good as the U.S. or, or not, but, mm -hmm. but they also face different <coughs> kinds of threats in the U.S., don't they? I mean, is there a more likelihood of, say, a, a organized crime uh, being able to procure a nuclear weapon in that country? <coughs> has, has your command looked at that problem? Uh, from what I saw, if, if what I saw is representative of strategic rocket forces, uh, organized crime getting their hands on a, a, a weapon out of their facilities uh, uh, would be extremely remote. Uh, I cannot speak uh, to uh, other facilities, but it gets back to the point of uh, under START three, we really ne need to start getting some uh, transparency uh, into their tactical nuclear weapons stockpile. Yeah. Yes, sir, back over here. Um, the modernization programs uh, for them has focused on the land-based and uh, the submarines as well. Have they basically told you they're giving up on the, the triad concept? And no, sir. Uh, <coughs> They, they, are, uh, they are doing a, a uh, research and development program on a uh, new air launch cruise missile for their bombers. But they're not looking for a new platform, just a new, uh, not a new bomber as such, just a new. No, uh, you know, they, they, we see indications, for example, the, the, uh, the blackjack, uh, apparently uh, they've got some that are still undergoing uh, uh, Construction and should be rolling out of a plant here uh, before too much longer. The new cruise missile is that comparable to the AGM-129? Uh, no. <coughs> Better or not? Well, just entirely different concept. It sounds like there's a lot of building activity across all three legs of the triad. No, 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 no. Not not a lot. There, they they have uh, they have not modern. We made some very wise investments back in the 80s with the B-2 bomber, the B-1 the uh, advanced cruise missile, the uh, Ohio-class uh, Trident submarine, the D-5 missile. Uh, the Russians uh, weren't modernizing the forces uh, as we were during that time frame. And what's happening is that the service life of their systems is, is coming to an end. And uh, that's one of the reasons why, uh, in my view, the Russians very much want to get down to start three levels very quickly because uh, they're, they're, the SS-18, for example, which is their heavy ICBM with 10 warheads, uh, the thing is just flat, you know, running out of uh, service life. Follow up real quick. Did you talk doctrine? Uh, there's some word that Russians are thinking about adopting a policy of extended deterrence, meaning uh, first launch, uh, you know, first use on behalf of allies, so-called uh, allies. We, we did not discuss uh, that particular aspect. We discussed doctrine, we discussed arms control, we discussed uh, uh, stability, uh, those kinds of things, but uh, not to, to, that, to that level. Sir, uh, as the Secretary is going to be coming down here at 2 o'clock, I would suggest we take, have time for about one more. Okay. Uh, somebody hasn't asked a question. I'll give you one shot. All right. Go over here. <laughs> Did you talk about stockpiles? But you've got to be as articulate as the rest of the guys. <laughs> and specifically comprehensive test ban and, and uh, you know, we have a problem here about uh, keeping our nukes viable under the comprehensive yeah. test ban. What, what's uh, your there? Uh, good question. Uh, I'm right in the heart of that fight because uh, uh, when the president announced in August 1995 that we were going to proceed down the, the, the comprehensive test ban treaty, uh, he directed that the commander chief of U.S. Strategic Command would provide an independent assessment. Uh, I did that last year for the first time, and uh, my assessment to the, my boss, Secretary of Defense, was that our, our stockpile was safe and reliable. Uh, I just completed uh, uh, an assessment, and I have a team of uh, civilian experts uh, who work uh, on an advisory group for me, pro bono. This group has been around, not the same people, but the, the concept has been around for over 35 years. They've served the Commander-in-Chief, SAC, and now STRATCOM. Uh, I've got a team of eight uh, very independent 
thinkers uh, who are previous uh, weapon lab directors, uh, weapon engineers, weapon uh, designers, and they uh, have provided me uh, their independent assessment. I've gone into this in great depth, and, and it's a year-by-year -year kind of thing. And uh, as I reported again to the Secretary of Defense this year, our nuclear weapon stockpile is safe and reliable. And I will, I will do that every year, and whoever succeeds me will do the same thing. General, just to clarify one thing you said earlier about the, the three-person uh, as opposed to two yes, in the sir. United States. You said get close to a nuclear weapon. Well, what you meant was to launch a nuclear weapon. No, sir. I'm, oh, I, 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 what I meant by that, and I'm talking about uh, access to a nuclear weapon itself. The, the launching of a nuclear weapon is, is, uh, is very complicated. It is very... Uh, the, the, the controls are very robust. Uh, it, uh, there are a lot of safeguards built in, trust me. You mean three guards? Three no, no, I'm talking about if you wanted to open up a bunker in a Russian nuclear weapons uh, storage area, uh, you have to, at our sites, you need two people to go do that who understand uh, what they're doing, whatever tasks they're going to do. In Russia, you need three people. And oh, by the way, in Russia, the, when you open up that, that, uh, that igloo, you have to have a written order signed by the, uh, the, the full colonel, who's the special unit, uh, special te uh, technical unit commander. Uh, uh, whereas we don't, uh, we don't uh, have those specific kinds of uh, requirements. Did the Russians can, uh, express any concern to you of the possibility of a peace maker type <coughs> scenario coming out of the mob obtaining some kind of tactical weapons? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, they, they made it very clear to me that uh, uh, they, they, uh, they train uh, to, uh, to ensure that uh, those kinds of things uh, uh, just wouldn't happen. I need to see that movie, by the way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you were discussing the military doctrine and nuclear doctrine. Have you heard anything new or something which uh, would worry you? as a commander of strategic no, forces. Not at all. Not at all. Thanks for the opportunity to come talk to you. Thank, Thank you. We know who you are. I want to say is that after Secretary Cohen uh, completes his statement, he'll take a question or two, and then Jeff Starr uh, is here from the uh, Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, and he will brief on background with additional answer additional questions. Secretary Cohen. Uh, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to announce another successful milestone in our Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. As a result of an accord that the United States signed with the Republic of Moldova uh, in June of this year, we recently purchased uh, 21 advanced nuclear-capable MiG-29 fighters uh, from Moldova. Uh, over the last two weeks, we've been transporting these MiGs in C-17 transport aircraft from Moldova to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Uh, this is a joint effort, <coughs> excuse me, by <coughs> the White House too much. <coughs> <laughs> this is a uh, joint effort by both governments to ensure that these uh, dual-use military weapons do not fall into the hands of countries that might use them against us, uh, our friends, or allies. We have credible information that a number of rogue states, including Iran, are attempting to buy available Russian high-tech equipment and weapons in the aftermath of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, these MiG aircraft were on their shopping list. This is another growing list of achievements of the Department's uh, Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which was initiated by Senators Sam Nunn and uh, Richard Luger. Among these achievements are the denuclearization of Belarus, uh, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine, the removal from Kazakhstan and the safe storage in the United States of some 600 kilograms of weapons-grade, highly enriched uranium, and the enhanced security control and accounting of nuclear weapons and fissile materials in Russia. The uh, CTR program has made remarkable uh, progress in reducing, controlling, and eliminating the greatest potential security threat to Americans, and that is the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction from the former Soviet Union. Leaders in the Republic of Moldova took a visionary approach in this effort. 
The agreement regarding these MIGs contributes to the enhanced climate of trust uh, in relations between Moldova and the United States. And I want to personally extend my uh, thanks to uh, President uh, Luchinsky and Minister of Defense uh, Passat. Their leadership and cooperation is another positive step in the development of a greatly enhanced relationship between the United States and Moldova. I also want to thank the Congress for its sustained support for this enormously important program of the cooperative threat reduction in general and to this MIG operation specifically. And we look forward to uh, working closely with Congress in many other projects to reduce the threat of uh, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And with that, I entertain your questions. No. Mr. Secretary, could you tell us, are, are these the first uh, MiG-29s that the U.S. will obtain? Um, <coughs> and are they C models? Uh, the model, I think, that uh, Jeff would uh, tell you is, uh, the answer is yes. And these are the first that we have um, obtained. What, 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 are the consequences, what are the consequences if the, this sort of plane did get uh, into the inventory of the Iranians? Well, as you know, uh, Iran is uh, seeking to develop uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, they uh, have uh, programs uh, seeking to develop chemical, biological, and have been seeking to develop uh, a nuclear capability. Uh, and so to um, have this kind of aircraft uh, with uh, a nuclear um, develop uh, a nuclear capability of deploying uh, a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, it seems to me it's in our overall interest uh, to see to it that it doesn't fall into their hands if we can prevent it, uh, if at all possible. Mr. Secretary, Secretary, how much are we paying, how much are we paying for these? The uh, agreement was to maintain uh, uh, that we would not disclose the, the costs of the uh, aircraft. That was part of the agreement uh, that we did uh, strike with the, uh, the government. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we are going to be in a position to uh, assist Moldova with uh, um, humanitarian assistance and also with uh, EDA um, uh, equipment as such, uh, excess uh, uh, defense articles, uh, because of their uh, participation in the uh, PFP program. But uh, the agreement did call for us to uh, not disclose the, uh, the price for it. Can you tell us what I can assure you it's quite reasonable. Can you tell us what we're going to do with them? Uh, well, we're taking them out of the hands of those who uh, otherwise might acquire them. For openers number two, we will obviously uh, study uh, the uh, the capability of the aircraft uh, for our own, uh, you know, national security purposes. Because yes. these aircraft may very well fall into uh, this type of aircraft could very well uh, end up in the hands of, uh, of other uh, rogue uh, nations. Have you <coughs> and uh, General Shelton talked to the president about Iraq at today? Um, no. You plan on talking any uh, discussions at the White House? Uh, there will be discussion uh, this afternoon uh, with a number of congressional leaders. Uh, I will have an opportunity, I think, uh, prior to that to meet with the president on other matters. But uh, this issue of uh, Iraq obviously is uh, very much on the mind of the president uh, on all of the uh, national security uh, team. And uh, we will continue to follow it on a day-by-day -day basis. Have you notified the Russians of this purchase, and has there been any concern on their part that we're inspecting their weapons? The, uh, the Russians had uh, had prior notification. They knew about the uh, the acquisition of, of the uh, the MiGs. Now, the Russians are still making MiG-29s, and they're still marketing them. How does this uh, take the MiG-29 off the, off the international market? Uh, well, uh, we are still conducting our own uh, CTR programs with uh, the Russians directly. This is with a separate uh, country, of course, and so uh, um, we will still continue to deal with the CTR program with the Russians on a variety of programs. But obviously they can continue to manufacture their aircraft as we continue to manufacture ours. Our goal is to uh, take uh, this aircraft out of the hands uh, of potentially of uh, rogue nations that, uh, from countries that otherwise might be uh, inclined to uh, sell them for their value. How many other nuclear capable MiG-29s are in the inventory of the former you know, uh, Soviet uh, states? I mean, isn't this a potentially large pool of aircraft? we might eventually have to buy down the road? Well, uh, I can't give you right now, perhaps on background, you can get that information, uh, but I, I don't have that figure right now. Have the Iranians actually approached uh, the government of Moldova to buy these? Our aircraft? understanding is that uh, such an approach uh, was made, it was on their shopping list, and um, we are very happy to have them in our hands rather than the Iranians. Any other countries? Pardon? Any other countries beside Iran? Um, I think you get that on the background. Have the Iranians made a cash offer? Can you, do you know how much they were willing to pay? Uh, I, I don't have any uh, idea how much they're willing to pay. Did Moldova come to us, or did we find out about it and then approach them with a counteroffer? I think you'll get that on the subsequent briefing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is the U.S. going to do with these MiG fighters? With what? what is the U.S. government is going to do with these MiG fighters? 
with these, uh, we're going to study them. <laughs> we're going to analyze them, and uh, I'm sure that the uh, the Air Force may come up with uh, some uh, utilitarian uh, uh, use of them. So you said they came over on C-17s. Can they be flown? Will our pilots? They had to be fly? partially uh, dis dismantled in order to fly them uh, here, but uh, uh, obviously uh, one can. Uh, um, reestablish their their capability, but our purpose is not to do that, but rather to um, make um, an analysis of the capabilities to study what kind of uh, technology is involved, so that we can, should we ever in the future have to come into contact uh, uh, with another country that having this capability would know uh, what uh, protections we would need and how to counter uh, some of their uh, capability. Mr. Secretary, when you said this was the first first six purchase you meant of the C models, the United States has other Meg 29. You said that the Russians were notified ahead. Do they um, object to, at all to the transaction? Um, not to my knowledge. I have. Uh, I don't have any information, and they were aware of it. I believe they uh, were aware that uh, the Moldovan government um, uh, wanted to um, sell and dispose of the of the MiGs, and uh, obviously uh, it may have been an economical decision on their part that they have plenty of their own and didn't want to acquire uh, other uh, other inventory at this time. Can you say, uh, Mr. Secretary, if the Iranians are seeking? other uh, aircraft of this type from other sources at this time. Do we know that? I think that's a fair assumption. I fair think assumption. It, I think it's a fair assumption, indeed. They are seeking to acquire a capability of delivering weapons of mass destruction. This is one avenue of doing it. There will be uh, others that they will pursue. If that U-2 pilot flies, aren't you putting him in harm's way? We have pilots who fly in harm's way every day. Uh, whenever our aircraft are um, uh, flying over Northern Watch or Southern Watch, uh, they're uh, certainly uh, in harm's way. Uh, we believe that uh, this mission uh, will be carried out um, safely. And that is the purpose of the uh, UN team that is traveling to uh, Iraq to impress upon the Iraqis the importance of maintaining um, the uh, um, security of those who are engaged in uh, uh, inspecting um, Iraq's uh, uh, programs, and uh, so we would expect that they would abide by uh, uh, their prior pledge, um, and uh, we would hope that they would not um, take what we would see as a very dangerous um, step to in any way threaten this aircraft. Any Iraqi troop movement that you've been briefed on caused you any concern? <laughs> um, I really don't um, care to comment on any um, operational or intelligence matters. Just a, a quick one. Have you given the President a recommendation on whether or not he should veto the defense authorization bill? Whatever recommendations I have given to the President remain a matter between me and the President. We've had now a background brief group and walk you through uh, how we got into this and sort of give you the tick tock and how we're going. Thank Thank you just one item on some late news. Uh, out of Baghdad, we heard that uh, uh, the government in uh, Iraq has agreed to postpone any expulsion of uh, American inspectors until after the, this mission uh, arrives. Do you, have you heard about that? Do you have any reaction? That is a positive development. We always turn to you, Jamie, uh, to get the latest uh, on what is happening. Uh, you are the first that uh, has disclosed that to me. The Honorable Rudy De Leon. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. May I introduce at this time the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs, the Honorable Deborah R. Lee. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, one and all. Uh, thank you very, very much for uh, joining us this afternoon as we pay tribute to some very, very special members of our team. Uh, 
Uh, I am Deborah Lee, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs, and let me, before I go any farther, just take a moment to recognize some of our uh, distinguished uh, persons who are gathered here today. Of course, our Under Secretary of Defense, Mr. De Leon, our National Chair for Employer Support, Bill Bowen, Secretary of the Navy, John Dalton, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, Terry O'Connell, Chairman of the Reserve Forces Policy Board. I see many friends from the Congress and colleagues from the Pentagon uh, and the associations who support us on a daily basis. So I very much thank you for being here. Um, as I said earlier, we're here today to say a, a special thanks to key members of the team. Uh, the presentation of our 1997 Employer Support Freedom Awards. These awards annually recognize those employers who have demonstrated extraordinary support for the National Guard and Reserve. So you might say that this is the Academy Awards for our superstars uh, in uh, our employer support. I'm also very pleased to announce that in recognition of the significant contributions made by all the employers of America, uh, the, re the President recently signed a proclamation declaring this week um, as the National Employer Support of the Guard and Reserve Week, and that's a first. So I'd like to um, share a part of that proclamation with you at this time. Employer Support of the Guard and Reserve Week 1997 by the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. All around the world, with America's help, nations are moving from conflict to cooperation. However, we still face challenges that have taken on new and dangerous dimensions. The National Guard and Reserve play a vital role in the response of America's armed forces to this broad spectrum of challenges to our national security and are an indispensable part of our effort to promote peace and democratic values. While most Americans understand the strategic and military value of our National Guard and Reserve forces, too often we fail to recognize or acknowledge the important contributions of their civilian employers. When called upon to share their greatest <clears throat> resource, these employers subordinate their own interests for the good of our country, even when they may incur financial hardship and organizational disruption. It is only because of the willingness by employers to place our nation's well-being above their own that our National Guard and Reserve are able to provide mission-ready and accessible forces to help preserve our freedom and protect our national interests. Now, therefore, I, William J. Clinton, President of the United States of America, do hereby proclaim November 2nd through November 8th, 1997, as National Employer Support of the Guard and Reserve Week. I encourage all Americans to join me in expressing our thanks to the civilian employers of the members of our National Guard and Reserve for their extraordinary sacrifices on behalf of the nation. Increased reliance on the National Guard and Reserve is a real cornerstone of this administration's strategy. And uh, whenever uh, any of us travel anywhere in the world nowadays where the U.S. military is deployed, you can absolutely be guaranteed that the Guard and Reserve is deployed right alongside the active duty forces, a very, very integral part of the team. We must never lose sight of the fact, however, that our National Guard and Reserve are part-time military and they are full-time something else. They are full-time uh, employees in the companies like those who are represented here today. They are the very fabric of our communities across the country. Uh, they have family members and so they are very, very uh, busy people. As the President stated, we must never lose sight of the fact that they could never do what they do for us if it weren't for what you, the employers of America, do for them and the support that you give to them. And for that, we are very, very grateful. And we are gathered here uh, to say thanks in our own small way. I will tell you that all of the 24 employers that were nominated for consideration for this award are true winners in our book. But we had to pick uh, five outstanding ones, and that we did. Uh, they are here with us today representing different regions of the country and, of course, our national winner as well. I just want to take a moment and tell you a little bit about the selection process, the selection criteria. First of all, each of these companies was nominated by their own reservist employees, many of whom uh, are here today and with the sponsorship of their um, ESGR state committees. And again, many of our volunteers are here today. 
Uh, we then reviewed uh, the nominations for certain criteria. The first criteria was a willingness to support employees in the Guard and Reserve through company policies and practices concerning time off for training and active duty. Very, very important for us. The second criteria was demonstrated pride and public acknowledgement of the contributions made by their employees who serve in the reserves. The third criteria is the company's willingness to go beyond the minimum requirements of the law uh, in support and taking care of their reservist employees. And the last criteria uh, dealt with families, the willingness on the part of companies uh, to assist families both before and during periods of training as well as mobilizations. Now, excelling in any one of these areas uh, generally marks an employer as above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, but the companies that you're going to hear about today, and we are going to brag on these folks because we're awful proud of them, have gone way, way beyond in all of these areas. The Charles Machine Works, East Penn, the Home Depot, Entech, Fred Meyer Company, they truly are our superstars, and we are deeply, deeply appreciative of, of all that you have done for us. It is uh, now my pleasure to introduce um, a man who is uh, charged with the overall readiness uh, and all of the personnel issues for our total force, active component, guard, and reserve. Uh, and these issues, believe you me, are at the top of the department's agenda um, because of uh, his work on behalf of our Secretary of Defense, Bill Cohen. He is a real friend of the Guard and Reserve. I have known him and worked for him in one capacity or another for many years. Uh, he is our new Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, the Honorable Rudy De Leon. Well, thanks very much, Debbie, for the uh, the introduction, and I appreciate the chance to be here with each of you and to participate for Secretary Cohen uh, in this important ceremony. Um, you know, I look at these awards, and uh, we have a lot of award ceremonies. I'll say these are very impressive awards, and I now know why in my pre-brief they told me to make sure that I hold these awards with two hands and, <laughs> and don't drop them. Not only do they look big, they also look really fancy. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Navy Secretary John Dalton, and I see a lot of friends from my previous life in the Air Force and a lot of new friends from the, uh, the uh, Army and uh, Navy and Marine Corps Reserve uh, as well, and Terry O'Connell and Charlie Cragen and some of the other people here from, uh, from Reserve Affairs. This is an important moment for us to acknowledge uh, those companies uh, that allow Americans to volunteer and, and participate. We use the term weekend warriors, but to be honest, it's not a weekend thing. Uh, the armed forces that America has today is the best trained, best equipped, best led armed forces in the world, whether they're on active duty or whether they're serving in the Guard and Reserve. That's the standard that the President has established for us. That's the standard that Secretary Cohen holds us to. And really, that is the standard in the field uh, when they're at work. And so there's really nothing weekend about it. Um, we rely on the <coughs> skills and the professionalism and the accessibility of the 1.6 million men and women in our reserves. And over 12,000 of them have served in Bosnia, Croatia, Hungary, Germany, Italy, and elsewhere over the last two years, a time of great change, a time of high demand, of high personnel tempo. Uh, the Guard and Reserve have been part of the team that America has sent on this peacekeeping mission. Uh, as someone who's been there, I can say that uh, the American-led NATO force has made a tremendous difference, has had a great impact in Bosnia. The Guard and Reserve forces were criti critical to that success. Um, in fact, the peacekeeping forces can't get in or out of Bosnia without the Army National Guard. They operate the life support area at the staging base in Tazar, Hungary. And so here we are, a small group of us landing at Tazar, Hungary uh, last summer uh, to sit and meet and talk. And uh, lo and behold, it's the Mississippi guard there on the ground saying, hey, do you know Sonny Montgomery? <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, I did. Um, 
I had to make sure I had my photo taken, taken with them, pass that along to Sonny, but uh, the guard was there playing a critical role at the base in, in Tazar. Today we rely more on our guard and reserve forces than ever before. There are more missions, more places, more roles, more often. That more often piece is important because that's where the employer support comes in. They're part of our force, and when their unique skills need to be deployed to the theater, we need cooperation. We need your support so that they can be there and to participate and bring those vital skills to uh, the battlefield far away. And, you know, this is not just something we do to make the total force and the Guard and Reserve feel good about their participation. It's essentially a reality of the new world that we live in. Uh, for 40 years, we had a forward deployed force that was essentially ready in Europe, in Korea, for whatever crisis would come. Well, we're still forward deployed in Korea, and we still have forces in Europe, but today we're largely a CONUS based force. And uh, I have a little speech I give to those uh, in the Air Force and Army about how they need to look at their Navy and, uh, and Marine Corps brethren because they, they know this op tempo of sort of going TDY from the, uh, the home CONUS base and having a deployment cycle and then coming back to, to, to home base. And so it's a lesson for the Navy and Marine Corps to share with the, the Army and Air Force who are getting ready to new, to, uh, to operate under new kinds of deployments and, and new kinds of contingencies. Uh, but this integration is, is important. Uh, we don't want to wear any one particular segment of the force out by continuously deploying them. We want to make sure that we use, uh, to use a sports term, the full bench, that we allow each member of the team to participate. And so this integration, this total force integration that Debbie Lee talked about, is essential to what we do. Uh, it means that Guard and Reserve units are fully trained and equipped to serve as an effective part of joint and combined forces in peace and war. Um, and that our active and reserve components are as flexible, as interoperable, and capable as our active duty forces. So a larger role for the Guard and Reserve translates into more sacrifices for them, for their families, and it also means that we need the direct support of the civilian employers that they work for. Well, today we're going to recognize uh, some of uh, those companies that really support their people in the field. And uh, it's appropriate that we do this. To say, though, that simply because we have this one ceremony uh, in early November uh, and take recogni recognition of it doesn't mean that uh, this is something we we lose track of. This is something that we work on 365 days a year, and if we could say thank you 365 years, we would. But I know that uh, Bill Bowen is out there, that he is walking the walk and talking the talk to let you know how vital your own contribution is. And so, Bill, I just thank you for, for all of the work and all of the effort you bring forward. I know also that, uh, that uh, Senator Nichols and uh, Senator Inhofe were going to send representatives. Did, uh, are they here? If you just uh, stand, uh, we appreciate the support that we get from the Senate and uh, would like to thank uh, both of those senators uh, for the help that they give us day in, day out. Also, thanks for being here. Um, now to the fun part, to give the awards to Penn Manufacturing, to Intech Services, to Home Depot, to Fred Meyer, to Charles Machine Works. Uh, each of these companies have gone to great lengths to ease the burden their, their employees face when they have to leave and serve in uniform. They've encouraged their employees, they've honored their service, and they offer flex time and helpful pay policies. Charles Machine Works from Oklahoma offers 15 days of paid military leave and contributed more than 80,000 to help refurbish a local National Guard armory. 
that's sort of uh, putting your your uh, your money where your mouth is, or uh, as they say in the Bible, where your treasure is, so will be your heart. So uh, uh, to the folks at uh, Charles Machine Works, uh, we'll have a chance to formally recognize you in a second, but uh, we want to particularly say thank you. Uh, these awards are a small way of, of saying thanks um, for the sacrifices our people make in the field every day and for the sacrifices uh, that you as employers make. So. Most of all, I want to thank you for going above and beyond the call of duty in doing your part, of participating with us, of joining with us, and uh, essentially of allowing America, in the words of the President, uh, to have the best trained, best equipped, most ready force in the world. So uh, look forward to uh, giving these awards and thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> The Secretary of Defense takes great pleasure in recognizing the dedication and selfless service of these employers and in presenting the 1997 Employer Support Freedom Awards as selected by a panel of drilling reservists. The Employer Support Freedom Award winner for the Northeast region is East Penn Manufacturing Company Incorporated from Lyon Station, Pennsylvania. Representing East Penn is Mr. Delight E. Breidigan, Jr., Chairman. East Penn Manufacturing employs over 400 reservists and former military service members, including 26 employees currently active in the National Guard and Reserve. East Penn's company policies encourage and support service in the reserve components, and their company's leadership personally extends that support and appreciation to every drilling reservist on their payroll. Employer Support Freedom Award winner for the Southeast Region is Home Depot, based in Tampa, Florida. They are represented by Mr. Daniel Knipe, District Manager. The Home Depot, Tampa District, employs 40 members of the National Guard and Reserve. They aggressively hire reserve personnel and their company policies and programs ensure company benefits remain in place for all employees called to active duty. Home Depot keeps in touch with the employee family members when they are activated for more than 30 days and their support for service in the reserve forces extends from the top of the corporate ladder down to the lowest level supervisor. <clears throat> The Employer Support Freedom Award winner for the North Central Region is Entex Services Incorporated from Peoria, Illinois. Representing Entex Services is Mr. Thomas Weed, President. In a workforce of only 30 full time employees, Entex employs six members of the selected reserve. Their company policies in support of reserve duty include flex time work schedules and paid time off for drill periods and annual training. Entech maintains company health care benefits for family members during extended activations and deployments and they publicly acknowledge the contributions made by their employees serving in the reserves at company meetings. The Employer Support Freedom Award winner for the West Region is Fred Meyer Incorporated from Portland, Oregon. They are represented by Mr. Joe Entile, Senior Vice President. Fred Meyer was the first employer in Oregon to install differential pay for employees serving on active duty. Their company policies also call for maintaining all company benefits for families when an employee is called to active duty.
They have an active family support program and help sponsor a National Guard summer camp for underprivileged children. The National Employer Support Freedom Award winner presented to the nation's most outstanding employer of the members of the National Guard and Reserve for 1997 is Charles Machine Works from Perry, Oklahoma. Representing Charles Machine Works is Mr. Ed Mazelhan, President and Chief Executive Officer. Charles Machine Works is one of the largest employers in North Central Oklahoma and employs 16 members of the Oklahoma National Guard and Reserve. They have developed an outstanding relationship with Guard and Reserve units throughout the North Central part of the state and contributed over $80 million for material and labor to refurbish and remodel the National Guard Armory in Perry. <laughs> My apologies, sir, that is $80,000. It is still a very nice armory. <laughs> Additionally, they have a family support program that ensures employees and family members are aware of the military benefits available to them during military mobilizations. <laughs> <laughs> At this time, we would like to ask all the award recipients, please, to join oh, stay here, stay right Secretary here. De Leon right for a here. group photo. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony this afternoon. Thank you for attending, and we invite everyone to please come forward and congratulate our award recipients. Thank Kodak you. Loves you.